beautiful event and great to see him here again. Right. So, hi, my name is Tomas Wondra. Uh, I'm a long term Postgres contributor, developer, committer. I currently work in, at Microsoft and uh, I'm here to talk about performance archaeology. Uh, actually, there was a talk about like a different type of archaeology, and we are also in Greece, which is like famous for, you know, historical artifacts. This is like completely different and unintended like pun uh, about that. Um, there is a brief agenda of of the of the talk. First, I will try to explain what this talk is about, like why I'm actually doing that. Um, and then we will go to some performance results for past releases, right? Um, for releases all the way back up to PostgreSQL uh, 8.0, which at this point is roughly 20 years old. Um, by the way, if you have any questions during the talk, please ask them immediately. Don't wait until the end. I, I think it's like easier to respond right away before I lose context or and so on. And also, um, if you don't understand something because of my accent, please ask. I will repeat that. For so we think, obviously, I will repeat that with exactly the same accent. So, um, but that's the best I can do, right? Um, Anyway, um, why I'm actually doing this benchmark or, or this talk? Uh, I'm a developer, and for the past many years, I've been actually working on performance features. And uh, once in a while, people do ask, like, how did the performance actually evolve over time? Like, did we improve the performance um, of, of Postgres? Um, and it's actually quite tricky uh, question to answer, right? Because usually, at least during the development, we usually do benchmarks on individual commits, right? And we kind of like focus the benchmarks on a very narrow part of the, of the code. And so we like benchmark that particular patch. And it's really difficult to extrapolate that to the whole code base. And also, it's difficult to combine many of those small benchmarks to like the total effect for the whole release. What sometimes happens is that people do benchmarks on like a new release and compare that to the previous one and publish that, which is perfectly fine. It's really interesting. But even then, it's like difficult to com combine those partial results into a long term view of uh, like how did the performance actually evolve over time and that happens for many time many reasons uh, people do upgrade uh, upgrade hardware for example so that like it's not immediately and easily um, uh, comparable the results from many of those benchmarks because they just happen on different hardware uh, how would you combine that it's not clear and of course, there's also the, the effect that this doesn't actually happen in the in the vacuum, right? We also improve, we get the benefits, the improvements from other parts of the system, not just from Postgres, but also from, from the operating system and hardware and so on. So combining all those effects into, uh, into a better view of, of how performance of Postgres itself changed is not very clear. Um, sometimes people uh, try to make judgments based on application performance, but obviously, like people do improve and evolve the application to do more stuff. The applications do handle more data over time, and so on. So even that is like um, not very clear, not a very good way to make these judgments. So th this is like. Um, why uh, why it's not perfectly fair comparison. But even, so what I did, and what I will show later, is I built a number of Postgres releases, and I built uh, and I run a, a bunch of, uh, you know, traditional benchmarks, uh, PGBench and like TPCH for different kinds of workloads. 
And the, I did that on specific hardware. And even that is a bit unfair, right? Because uh, the hardware may not be available, might not have been available like 20 years ago. Like, um, I will start with Postgres 8.0, and that's like from 2005. And that's roughly the time when um, the first CPUs with multiple cores actually started to appear, right? Which means that the Postgres was not optimized for that, right? Because why would you optimize uh, the software for something that is not actually available to customers or to users, right? Like no one cared about like multiple cores. Well, maybe some other system did, but it was, it was not widely available. So no one optimized for that. Similarly for storage, like 20 years ago, I, I don't even remember if SSDs were available, certainly not as widely as now, right? Like most of the, most of the storage was spinning disks. So once you started uh, to hit IO, all the other stuff didn't matter, right? It didn't matter if your CPU was perfectly optimized or like the, if it was optimized for the CPU, because you've been just waiting for IO so much longer. But all of this improved. And uh, so I decided to use like a hardware from let's say halfway through the, through the period, right? So all the hardware that I'm going to use is like from 2016, 2012, something like that. Uh, so let's do some benchmarks. Um, there will be a lot of numbers, a lot of charts. I try to make that as easy to understand as possible. If something is not clear, let me know. Uh, the short version is like, it's much faster, right? Uh, and also not just faster, but much more scalable. Like we can handle, I don't know, hundreds of cores at this point, uh, at least in some benchmarks. Uh, and uh, there is definitely uh, a lot of stuff to improve. If you've been to to Andres Freundstahl talk on, I think it was on Wednesday, about like Numa uh, and the bottlenecks he you know analyzed. There are ways to improve this even further. So the first type of benchmarks um, I did is OLTP. I picked like two kind of extreme cases of workloads. OLTP, small transactional uh, uh, operations that you know only affect a small number of rows, like lookups by primary keys and so on. And then. In the second part of the of the talk, I will be talking about um, about TPCH, which is analytical workload, which means like large queries and so on. But OLTP is, and I I, I pick these two workload types because applications typically do combine these two things in some way, right? It's a mix. But OLTP, uh, the hardware I use is um, like. Uh, a machine that I have at home, uh, which is a machine with two sockets, 44 cores, physical 88 threads. So it's not exactly like big by today's standards, but in like 2016, it was like a pretty massive machine, right? And like in 2005, this was like um, a dream machine, essentially. So, but other than that, it's using SSDs, it's using um, RN Debian, it's using GCC um, um, 12. Um, so it's like current machine. And uh, there is a very simple benchmarks for OLTP, which is PG Bench. Um, it's, we call it like TPCB like, because it's not the exact implementation. Um, and I will be showing results for a number of parameters, like combinations, different cases of, of the benchmark. Um, I will be showing different data sets. I will be showing small data set, which means the data fits into shared buffers. I'll be showing data for the la large results, which means it's bigger than memory available in, in the machine, which means it's IO bound usually. I will be showing read only, read write, and different client counts. The different client counts is mostly a way to 
to show scalability, right? How we can handle highly concurrent workloads with many clients doing stuff at the same time. Uh, because of the number of combinations, um, uh, I had to do fairly short runs, uh, uh, which means like a minutes for each combination of parameters. But even I verify that on like longer runs and the results are mostly the same, right? Um, and I use some sort of like unified um, configuration for Postgres because we also like improved and like allowed um, some parameters to be higher. For example, 8.0 doesn't actually allow more than two gigabytes of shared buffers, which seems like insane by today's standards. Um, and other stuff like that, we also changed some defaults. So I made all of that like the same, right? On all the instances. Uh, and one important detail is that I always use PG Bench from Postgres 18 because we also like improved some bottlenecks in, in the benchmarking tool itself. And I, I don't want to be benchmarking that, right? I want to be benchmarking the database. So um, I use uh, Postgres 18. Well, Postgres 18 means current development version, right? Because the last release version is 17. This is like what is in the Git repository at this point. And this is the first set of results. All the charts in the OLTP uh, part of the talk will look like this. What's on the x-axis are the versions of Postgres. You can you see that it starts with eight. Then there's like, it skips one point, uh, 8.1, because I've been unable to build that. Like the older the release, the harder it is actually to build, right? Because like some of the tools that we rely on also changed over the over the years, and it's actually getting difficult to to build that. So, but I've been able to build 8, 8.2, and then all the releases since then. And then the different different um, lines are for different client counts, right? So for example, blue is a single client. Green is 64 clients, right? And the number on, on the y-axis, on, on the vertical axis, that's the throughput. That's the number of transactions that we can make. So you can see that, for example, with um, 64 clients, we initially start with like I don't know, 10,000 transactions maybe. And now we are doing like uh, more than half a million. Yes? Um, so, sorry, what's the question? Uh, it's both, it's both. Yes, I, I always use the same number of clients as, as the jobs to to prevent any like bottleneck in that sense. Yeah, it's the same Yes, yes, it's always local 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 benchmark. Yes. Good questions, thank you. Yeah. I sorry, yeah. Simple to medium is the complexity of the transaction? So um, simple means it's a simple protocol. It's not prepared statements. Okay. And small uh, scale, uh, 100 means like 1.5 gigabyte, right? Um, roughly, because if you multiply it by 15, that's roughly the size of the database. Okay. And minus S, minus S means uh, select only. So, so this is read only benchmark, okay. right? Um, and um, you can see that with the simple protocol, uh, we can do this much, like almost like a million transactions. If you use prepared statements, which is like it skips the planning of the queries, we do roughly double the throughput. What is more important on this is that we did really bad job with the scalability on the older releases up to, I think, like 9.2, 9.3. You can even see that actually. It, it goes down here, right? That means regression, which is not a good thing. Uh, but since then, uh, since like 9.4 and 9.5, we are actually like doing much, much better. Uh, and uh, 
you also see roughly uh, the expected behavior, which means that if you increase the number of clients, we improve the throughput. Although, of course, like once you start going from like uh, 128 to 256, it doesn't actually improve, right? There's like even small like regression because of the overhead. The same applies to the prepared segments, except that the throughput is like so much higher. Unfortunately, since 9.5 or something, we, we do not actually improve like very much. Um, those are mostly like incremental small improvements. We do a lot of work to improve by like 5%. So this was read only. If you go to read write, you see roughly the same, same thing. Yeah. Yeah, just to verify, these are the latest commits of each of these versions? Uh, yes. Okay. Those are always the last, last commit of that. Um, so with read write, you see mostly the same image. Um, by the way, I have all already published the slides, so you can you know, download them from, from my website or from the conference website. Um, you can see that for read write, it's roughly the same like general picture there's um of course you know the 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 truth put is like much lower right because we also need to write transaction log and commit records and all of that but generally speaking the the truth put has uh, improved significantly over the years um on average i think it's like um, 20 to 50 times faster on the small data set which is significant right um if you look at the large data set, which is like 450 gigabytes, the machine has only like 64 gigabytes of RAM, so it's like three times that much. Uh, we do see some significant initial improvements on the earlier versions in the 8 dot something branch. But since then, it's like uh, uh, not improving very much. It's there, there's a lot of like variability here, but that's because of the very short runs, right? I mean, like if I did properly, proper long benchmark runs, this would disappear. Um, so, but overall, I think this is like super, super great. And there's a lot of things that can be improved, and we can actually improve not the per client, per connection throughput. But usually the the scalability aspect of of uh, of that. Watch the um, once the recordings are out. I strongly advise you to watch the the, the talk by Andres Freund. Um, but like PG Bench and OLTP is like super simple. Uh, the it essentially only does like lookups by primary keys in a single table without any joins or anything like that. I think your application probably is more complicated than that. And um, one pattern that I saw in applications in on production systems is something I call like OLTP star join. Like you are probably aware of like uh, what a star join is, right? In th that's um, a query pattern in uh, analytical databases where you have like one table and you join that to many, many dimensions, and then maybe place some conditions on the on the dimensions, right? So, for example, you can have like a, a, a fact table with orders, and then you have a, a dimension with customer details, and you can also put some conditions on what the customer uh, needs to, the conditions that the customer needs to meet, right? For example, it could be like a region or something. Um, the OLTP, and of course, that, that like reads large amounts of data from the fact table. The the OLTP version of the star join is something um, where you do a lookup by primary key in the large table. Like it could be a big table of customers or, or big table of transactions, and you look up by transaction ID, and then you look up some additional information about the transaction. Right in in the dimensions, so you only select a tiny fraction of the table, of the large table, and then look up additional details in the dimensions. Uh, 
it's a very common pattern. You can imagine uh, something like uh, like this, and uh, it usually looks roughly like this. You have the the large table, which I call T. You look up in that by primary key, and then you join to additional tables. If you do this with ten dimensions on a tiny data set which fits into shared buffers. How many transactions do you think uh, uh, you, you can do? What, what, what throughput would you expect per second? Like, who, who would expect at least like, I don't know, 100,000 transactions per second, right? No, you do like roughly 2,000 transactions, uh, with no matter how many clients you do, right? Because that's terrible, right? And that's even on a machine which has like almost 100 cores. And uh, that's with uh, minus and simple, uh, which means a simple mode, right? Because you, you need to do all the planning for each the query. If you switch to prepared trans, uh, statements, to, to the prepared mode, which means you only do the query planning once, and then you just run the, the queries over and over, we actually can do almost like 300,000 transactions. And you actually see that there are some significant improvements over the years where we just like significantly improve the throughput. So for example, 9.2, uh, thanks to fast path locking, which was introduced, um, I think Robert Haas uh, did that, that actually improved the the truth put to like almost hundred thousand transactions. Then in between thirteen and fourteen, we I don't know which exactly the version uh, which change exact exactly responsible for that. There has been a lot of improvements in that particular release. Um, so that's another significant improvement, which gets us all the way back well almost to three hundred thousand, right? halfway there. And then between 17 and 18, there is like a, another improvement in fast path locking, which gets us even higher. But this is only for prepared statements. Yes? What's the value of the blue line? One or n or? The blue line? That's a single client. But uh, I, I don't know what exactly is the number, but it's like, um, I, I think it's a couple thousand transactions per second. Okay. Right. But you said it on the home server, it No, um, it probably is not completely flat. I mean, like, it improves a little bit. But also, most of the improvements here, you can see, are from locking, right? And si single client doesn't have any locking problems, usually, right? So the question is, like, why, why is the regular, why is this so slow? Right? And if you just change that to left joints, you suddenly go like eight times faster, right? And the reason I have for that, the explanation, I haven't looked into the details very much, but it's just like the planning of the join order, right? Like by doing left joints, you restrict the number of like how, how the database can order the joins in which order then, uh, in which all the, the tables can be joined, which means it doesn't need to explore so many so many con uh, combinations, and therefore it's so much faster. So there is definitely a lot of like way to uh, a lot of opportunity to improve this, right? So if there is anyone who wants to look into this query planning, um, this would be great because it's there's so much benefit possible, and it's also fairly isolated thing in, in the query planner. So to sum the uh, OLTP part of, of, of this talk, I could have done many more benchmarks. I don't have time to, uh, you know, um, to uh, present all of this here. There has been some massive uh, scalability improvements, not necessarily the, you know, the throughput of a single client that actually regressed a little bit, but for the number of clients on many core systems that actually uh, it's common to see 20 to 50 times uh, 
faster, like more better throughput. Uh, the main improvements are like in 902, fast path locking. Um, there's a lot of improvements in 905, 906, and then in 14. Um, there have been a couple weird regressions in the early versions of uh, uh, a dot something branch, but that is mostly gone since 904 because we are, to be honest, we are paying far more attention to concurrency problems since those releases, right? I think we are mostly out of low-hanging fruit. Um, um, like the small small improvements, small patches that actually significantly increase the throughput. But I'm afraid this might actually be, you know, the f famous last words, because whenever I say something like this, the next day someone shows up with a patch which is like, oh, it's like five times faster. Uh, and um, Andres probably did some of that already. Yeah. Committed, yeah? Okay. Uh, I've been mostly ignoring, I mean, like, this is just showing the throughput, right? I mean, I've been showing, like, how many transactions can we do per second, but that mostly ignores the consistency of the behavior, right? Like, are we, are we doing consistently that exactly throughput every second, or are there some huge spikes, huge, you know, lows? Um, and we are actually doing far more, far better in that case, too. Uh, just on like 8.0, it was easy to, to get like super unstable behavior where um, unpredictable behavior. And now it's very, very smooth, right? At least compared to the, to the actual throughput. So um, that's OLTP. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Did, uh... Uh, what's the difference when it uses, like, was there a difference um, when you did change the left joins also when you had prepared the statements? Or what no, I mean, like, um, once you go to prepared statement, it doesn't really matter. Right, right, right. That was expected. Yes. Okay. yes. Cool. Okay. So um, there's probably fa uh, like other stuff that we can do for the OLTP. And a couple of days ago, I've been playing with um, optimization of the binary. Like no changes in, in the code in in Postgres, but actually applying like a tool which is called Bolt, and that's a tool developed I think by Facebook engineers, which kind of like look at the binary, look at the profile collected from the from some workload from from um, like when you are running perf, right, and uh, optimizing the binary for that. Uh, using that profile, and you can actually get like if you do that on Postgres on OLTP, you can get like a another like thirty percent improvement. I I'm not saying we should do this with the Postgres binary. Um, I can't really imagine using uh, Bolt like that, but it shows that there is you know the potential for additional improvements, and I hope that we can actually learn something from the Bolt because it can also like output, like recommendations, what to change in, in the code. And we can actually adopt some of that, right? Um, the bolt is usually like optimizing stuff like branching, branch predictability, and like improving these low level uh, metrics on the binary um, and, and allowing uh, the, the CPU actually to do a better job. So uh, there was OLTP. Uh, the next part is about OLAP. Uh, in this day, uh, this time I used like much smaller machine because it's simply simply uh, the benchmark doesn't need uh, such concurrency, right? The the, the parallel queries and so on. Um, the point is not about running hundreds of clients, but actually running one large query faster. So it's um, it's a machine from like 2012. Again, like roughly halfway through through the twenty years, um, and I use a benchmark which is called TPCH. I, I haven't done the full benchmark, uh, which is fairly complex. I just took the twenty two queries and I run those, right? And um, I also measured, of course, like how long does it take actually to load the data, build indexes, and stuff like that. Uh, if you if you know 
If you don't know TPCH or if you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend there is a paper by uh, uh, these authors like Peter Bonch, who I think was um, a keynote speaker last year at the conference, uh, Thomas Neumann and Ori Erling. They are actually looking at the 22 queries and actually analyzing like different like choke points, which are the bottlenecks explored, like uh, hit by each of those queries. Anyway, if you look at the TPCH data loads, then you will see something like this. This is the total duration in seconds for 10 gigabytes, uh, um, 10 gigabyte load. And you can see that on A.0, it takes like roughly one hour, right? Some of that, like the blue is like the copy statement, like loading the data into, into the tables then by far the most ex uh, expensive part of the data load is actually creating indexes. In all cases, the, the schema and index set was actually exactly the same. Right? Um, and then we do a little bit of like alter table, which creates foreign keys and that kind of stuff. And finally, there's like a vacuum to clean up everything. And you can see that between A.0 and A.2, it actually, uh, we cut the, the the load time in half. Then it's mostly stable up to like 9.5, 9.6. And then there are actually, uh, you can see the P, which means a parallel, right? That means that I also enable parallel uh, index builds, for example, right? And we do support parallel queries and uh, since 9.6. But we do not actually support parallel maintenance workers like for building indexes in parallel until 11. Right? So you can see that the parallelism for data loads gives you, uh, it reduces like 25% of, of the duration. But again, uh, you can see that it's like, if you ignore parallelism, you, you don't see any massive speed ups since 9.6. With parallelism, there is a significant improvement in 11, but since then it's like mostly stable. So this is good and bad. I mean, like we have already squeezed so much from, from that. Um, you can now load the 10 gigabytes on this small machine uh, within, I don't know, like uh, 15 minutes, right? It's like roughly 900 seconds here. So that's really nice. You could probably also split the data load into smaller chunks and actually do that in parallel on top of the parallelism we already have. Um, and uh, it would still be much faster. I do suspect that if we want to get more, you know, um, additional improvements in this, not just in data loading, but in analytics in general, we do need to adapt another type of storage. Right? I mean, like with row storage, there's just so much you can do. And we have already, we are already pushing the boundaries, I think. Um, for the queries, this is like the total duration of the 22 queries. Right? If you run all the 22 queries and sum all of that together, you will see something like this. Uh, again, there is a massive speed up between 8.0 and 8.2. I don't know if it's. Uh, uh, it, it might be in 8.1, uh, which I've been unable to build. Um, and I have actually shown here some of the, the, the features, the improvements that I think are responsible for, for the main speed ups right here. Because you can see there is like a speed up here, there is a speed up here, speed up here. Um, I've been told that actually in these releases, we, we have uh, implemented bitmap heap scans, like um, a different type of index scan. And that, that could be actually why I have like the question mark here. Because I've been unable to actually find out like what's responsible for that. I think that's a very good guess. That's very likely that bitmap heap scans actually improve that. Then uh, in uh, 8.4, we have implemented effective IO concurrency, which means prefetching for bitmap heap scans, right? So this is bitmap heap scans. This is also bitmap heap scans. Then 
in uh, 9.2, we have introduced index-only scans. So if you have index which has all the data that you need, we don't actually need to access the table at all, right? Which, again, is like a significant speed up. Then in 9.6, um, this is not the parallel query. We have improved like sorting, locking, and also we have improved um, uh, the estimates for some of the complex queries by using foreign keys, which if you improve the estimates, you, the optimizer has a bit better chance of actually picking the correct query plan. Then there is like some sort of uh, uh, like a, I don't know, 20% speed up thanks to parallelism, like parallel queries, actually doing more, more work. And since then, it's like mostly stable, right? It's like we haven't really improved that much. There is actually a bit of like uh, regression here. Uh, I haven't looked into, into the details, uh, but I suspect it actually might be my, my fault because um, in 13, there's like incremental sorts and uh, that can actually uh, misplan the query a little bit. Um, this is just like a slightly different way to look at that. This actually shows durations for individual queries. And you can see that initially, like each of those is one of the 22 queries. You can see that initially there have been quite a lot of like fairly long ones. And now if you look, it's, it's like there's one significant query which dominates the, the duration. That's query one, which is like one large aggregation. And there's very little we can do to improve that beyond what we have already done. The only solution, well, the only feasible way I, I can think of is actually improving uh, or changing the storage format, right? Because if you look at all the analytical databases um, that we might be competing with, they are all using like columnar storage. And I, I think that's like the only, only way to actually compete with them. Unfortunately, that's also a huge development task. And we have, we have actually been working on on a columnar storage but i don't think the, the 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 project is currently continuing anyway um i have not actually seen any actual regressions during the tpch benchmark i haven't seen any regressions in in uh, uh in oltp because those are just super simple queries that are really difficult to get wrong um, the, the queries in the TPCH are much more complex and there are far more uh, different options, different ways to actually execute them, which means like there are far more ways to get it wrong, right? So, um, but I haven't really seen any like obvious uh, regressions. I have seen some cases where the changes that we have made actually caused regressions, but it was easy to kind of fix that. So for example, in, uh, in one of the versions, I think it was 9.4, we have changed the, the default for effective cache size, right? We have, we have increased the, the size from 128 megabytes to four gigabytes. And we do not allocate more memory or anything like that. That just informs the, the query planner how much data is probably used, or how much memory is used for caching data for index scans. It, it makes the index, uh, it, it looks the, it makes the random IO look cheaper, right? So the optimizer is more likely to pick the index scan. And therefore, if you, if you had that, uh, if you have tuned all the other parameters to make the right decisions, and then we have you know, unexpectedly increased the effective cache size, suddenly you are probably doing index scans more often, like in cases where you don't want to be doing that. So um, that kind of like surprised me a little bit. Similarly, in I think Postgres 14, we have changed effective IO concurrency, which it, it determines how far we actually prefetch a hat. Right. So if you are reading a block, the prefetching means we want to prefetch, say, 16 blocks a hat. Right. 
we can we can ask the uh, ask the storage to actually do the read so that when we actually get to to that block it's already in memory right uh, and before 14 there was actually a, a fairly complex formula which um, increased the number somewhat right so if you set the the configuration parameter to 16 it actually prefetched like 54 blocks ahead right like significantly further ahead in 14 we said like oh it's too complex let's just use the number as it is which means we have suddenly started prefetching far less right and it makes sense i i still stand by the change but um it's it's a change in the default value which can have like unexpected effects it's just like the the bitmap heap scan suddenly takes twice as long right and it like nothing changed except for the gut which you may not actually realize and it's not the gut actually doesn't didn't change right it, it, it actually changed how we interpret the number right Similarly, uh, in Postgres 9.6, we, we started using foreign keys to improve estimates, which gives the optimizer like better chance to actually plan the query correctly. But I have actually seen some cases where um, that forces the planner or like the planner sees the better estimates and then does something like unexpected, right? There are probably more cases like that. Uh, what I'm trying to explain, trying to say is that uh, you need to be careful about like upgrades and you probably need to do some testing. We, we are very careful about like not causing bugs, not causing unexpected, um, unexpected behavior changes. But once in a while, something like this happens and you should at least like watch for that, right? You need to have some sort of application monitoring and say like, oh, this query suddenly takes like much longer, right? So, so why is that? Uh, so, summary for the OLAP tab, uh, OLAP part of the of the talk. Uh, we have seen some significant improvements over the years, um, especially in the early like a dot something uh, branch. But it, it's mostly stable since Postgres eleven, of course. Uh, we now have machines with like far more cores so the parallelism uh, can actually help you with that right because you can you can run the query with far more cpus and that actually gives you speed ups there are some potential improvements uh, i think those benefits will be mostly small uh, like um, we could do something like parallel copy or improve the copy uh, efficiency i do think there is there is room for improvements using uh the pgo like um profile guided optimization or the bolt that i have seen mentioned earlier interesting enough i haven't actually seen significant speed ups uh from bolt right it's like in in the oltp case it was like 30 percent faster something like that in uh, in the OLAP case, uh, it was maybe five percent faster, which is really really surprising, at least for me, because the OLAP queries are far more CPU intensive. They are doing far more like uh, operations that are, I think, suitable for uh, optimization of the type that Bolt does. Unfortunately, uh, for some reason, it didn't work. If there are people who would like to investigate why that is, or how to actually fix that, uh, I think that would be interesting. But I think uh, uh, I still stand by the assessment that for significant improvements with the given hardware, uh, th that would require um, like changes, fundamental changes to the storage engine, and not only that, but also to the executor. Right? Uh, because if you just compress the data, but then still do the row by row processing that we do now, uh, that has uh, limits of, of how efficient that can actually be. 
So uh, last couple of slides, um, the summary, substantial improvements. I, I feel very good about like uh, the work that we have done in the past. Uh, what should we expect in the future? Uh, I have mentioned that. I, I strongly believe that performance is not everything. Right? It's like if you have a database which is like super fast, but it's super difficult to operate and run in production, I, I wouldn't want to run that product in production. Right? Uh, so I think uh, we also need to focus on, um, you know, making it easier to to operate, especially on busy databases where performance matters. We also need to worry about like anti wraparound vacuums and like cleanup and this kind of stuff. So that was not actually uh, the topic of this talk, but I just want to mention that it's important. Uh, there are a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm not sure in, in the PG7, um, in one of the old TP charts, there was like a regression of Postgres 17. I don't know what that was about. I think someone should look into that. Uh, I think optimizing the star join, the jo join order would be like super interesting and super useful. And it's, um, I don't think we have touched or improved the join order in the past. Um, and it also seems like fairly isolated in the optimizer. So I think it would be like suitable for someone who wants to start hacking on Postgres. Um, I, I know people mentioned uh, things like genetic query optimizer and so on, which is something we supposedly have in Postgres. But I heard like from multiple people that it actually doesn't do anything. So like replacing that with something smarter would be nice. I know that some of the analytical databases are actually identifying uh, or looking for for exact patterns of like star joins and so on, and actually using like a, a special join algorithm for that. Maybe we should do something like that too, right? Like a fast path for this particular type of join. Uh, I'd like to learn something from the bolt because you can say like report bed layout and it will tell you. Um, uh, how to how to change the code to actually get the benefits, get the speed up without actually having to optimize the binary. And there is also plenty of NUMA stuff to improve, mentioned by Andres um, in his talk, uh, which is linked here. For OLAP, um, the Bolt didn't actually help very much. I haven't also. Uh, I haven't presented results for just-in-time compilation, uh, but I have done the benchmarks and I haven't seen any significant speed-ups. Uh, I don't know, uh, it seems strange. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think the more radical rethink may be needed. And that's the end of my talk. Um, there are the slides. Uh, those are the QR codes for uh, for that, but you can also find them on the conference website. There's a link already. Um, please fill the feedback, uh, both for this talk, but also for the conference. Uh, I think it's already open uh, at the conference website. Um, I haven't mentioned one detail, which is like glibc tuning. Uh, if you have, uh, if you are on a big machine and you are running Linux with like the default. Uh, libc memory allocator. This blog post might be interesting for you. And of course, if you want to do benchmarks and, or you want to just discuss some of the stuff that I presented here, feel free to reach out to me either here or by email. I also have something I call office hours, which just means I, I have dedicated time where uh, you can just you know ping me and we can have a call or on Zoom or something and uh, have a chat about whatever. Um, and that's it. That's all for me.